Um, so yeah, we'll be talking very much actually about uh, stuff which is we predates uh, Android, and um, um, that's going to be part of the fun. Um, so yeah, we'll be talking at the beginning about phones like that. Some of you, some of the younger ones there, haven't seen that. Well, it'll be just prehistory for you. And the other nice thing about this slide, I should mention it though, is that the maze there is not a picture. It is um, written with LaTeX, okay? So I think it's kind of a nice feature there, um, not to do that with a picture, but to actually draw the lines. Um, and actually there's a nice feature, so you don't exactly have to put all oh, points, of course, but you can say, go from here to there and do um, a sharp edge, and it works just fine. Uh, if you want to talk LaTeX, that can be also something, a uh, discussion for afterwards if you wish. Um, so one of the first things, actually, I'm going to talk to you about my summer vacation. Um, that would be also, uh, I suspect, a very nice um, keynote. But unfortunately for you, you're not going to get my uh, picture vacations and things like that. But I went to Greece. It was marvelous. Thank you very much. And I went to visit archaeological sites there, especially, actually, the labyrinth of um, King Minos, where you have the Minotaur, if you remember a little bit of that. And, um, well, it's basically 4,000 years old. And, well, okay, it's runes and, um, and things like that, but we have managed to keep quite lots of things. 4,000 years old, it's really impressive, a very large museum of many things, I don't know, of phases, uh, rings, plates, pl uh, plenty of things which have been kept. And then during uh, creating this keynote, I started to dig in 20 years old malware. And it was extremely hard just for 20 years old. Okay, so just believe if it had been 4,000 years old, that would be completely a different thing. So that's um, just you know, something probably you have to keep in mind is that, well, when you're digging out something which is more that's, I'd say, eight years old, well, all the links are broken. Um, the blog po posts are down. The websites have changed um, and things like that. So I had to find uh, things in my own backups in repositories. Um, I even had uh, a guy, a system admin from Fortinet, fix an issue in some old images of our blog post like 20 years ago. Uh, he did it, thank you very much, so that I could recover some images. And this is a little bit what I'm going to talk to you about. And um, I've been, I, I was hired at Fortinet in 2008, and directly I started to work as a mobile malware analyst and researcher. Directly in 2008, that was kind of a little bit innovative for the time, because, well, in 2008, and even afterwards, uh, after that, in 2010, I remember I had lots of interviews with journalists who believed that mobile malware did not exist, or that we were making up entirely the issue. So, Cool for me, I was working on something that did not exist, according to them. Um, but I can assure you, I already had quite lots of work at that time. Um, so just to get the entire picture, the first mobile malware, it was in 2004. So I missed the very first four years. But apart from that, I have been working on mobile malware since then. I am still working on mobile malware. It might seem a little bit monotonous, but thanks to malware authors, my work is very um, varied. I have lots of evolution there, and so I'm not bored at all. The first thing was very much on Symbian, Symbian OS. Um, and we had lots of worms and Trojan dialers. Those were the, fir the first ones. So this one there is the very first uh, mobile malware. It is called Kabir. It was running on Symbian OS, and it was propagating on Bluetooth. The only thing it was doing was actually print the screen, Carib and 29A. So 29A was a famous hacking group of that time. 
And that's the only thing it was doing, so not really dangerous, nearly more a proof of concept than really a malware, but it was the first one. Then I'll remember a little bit later, because the, um, the source code of that was actually published, so it inspired lots of other people. And when I arrived at Fortinet, I was very much busy at analyzing to, um, and detecting worms such as Bezalo, or you might have heard of Come Warrior, which were already infecting over 100,000 mobile phones at that time. Okay, so pretty already lots of infected people for something that did not exist. Um, Bezalo was um, propagating on Bluetooth, but also on MMS. And that was, I'd say, the main issue for people, is that at that time subscriptions, well, you didn't have everything inside it, and most of the time when you were sending out an MMS, it would cost a little bit to you. So if your mobile phone suddenly started sending hundreds of MMS, it would, of course, mean a little bit of cost for you, uh, and that wasn't really uh, the, the nice thing to have. Also at that time, a little bit later, well, they were, uh, that's one of the screenshots I managed to recover, but they were already posing as system updates, so this time Nokia updates, because it was many, uh, many, many uh, Nokia phones at that time. Mobile phones themselves, of course, had evolved, so those are all the mobile phones we, we had in our lab. Um, they were smaller, thicker, uh, smaller screen, and you can just compare the size with one which is a little bit more recent, um, 2019, it's already a couple of years old, but uh, still, you can see uh, the difference of size is quite impressive. We didn't have only um, Symbian phones, of course, we had a couple of others, Windows Mobile, Windows CE, for instance. And, well, this is basically the evolution of mobile phones themselves. Some of them expanded physically. This one. This is one of the iPhones I recovered from my cupboard, and, um, well, the battery had really expanded, and, well, fortunately, there was no, not, uh, no issue with that, but, of course, I removed it. 2009 is kind of... Um, really important milestone for mobile malware because we have the first mobile malware which is accessing internet. Before that, remember, they were propagating via Bluetooth or MMS, but not internet. And it's really an important change. And we're going to detail a little bit this one uh, that you might not remember, but which was really smart and very innovative, actually. So, access you first got infected mainly by downloading, well, by installing on your phone, um, well, the wrong application from the Symbian store. Well, we now have the Apple Store and Play Store. Well, at that time, it was the Symbian Store, okay? So you downloaded an application, and unfortunately, you got infected that way. And when the virus is, when the malware was running on your phone, it would directly decrypt URLs to contact a remote server. So already at that time, the URLs were encrypted in the binary. Then it would contact the malicious server, and from the malicious server, it would download a payload. Now, the, and install it on the phone silent, uh, silently. This mechanism is exactly what we have in most mobile malware in 2023, okay? contacting a remote server, downloading a payload, installing it, and doing that sometimes several times. Um, if some of you have followed, for instance, Android Joker, you have four different uh, inner um, contacts to a remote server and four different payloads, okay? But it's exactly the same mechanism. Then it would, of course, do something on your phone, grab all your contacts, send them to the remote server, and perhaps a little bit strange, but it would, the server would send back another list of phone numbers to contact, not your own, but others. And then you would send basically an SMS to all those people that you probably did not know, um, enticing them to go to this fabulous link there, where, of course, they would then download the malware and get infected. So, yeah. 
old but not stupid and pretty, uh, pretty impressive for, for, for that time there. The other thing that seems kind of so normal now is that the mobile phone was accessing internet. Well, at that time, it was really complicated actually to access internet from your mobile phone. You had to get a special setting from your operator telling uh, to access this or that access point with the port. Then you had to search on the mobile phone for the correct menu and put the settings in there and hope and pray that it worked. Okay. Uh, and the malware there was doing that exactly and automatically. It would go automatically and parse all the internet access points that you had configured, select one that was working, and use it to go to internet. While you were doing that, normally on Symbian, I mean, it wasn't just like open and no consideration of security at all, it would say, oh, probably we should pop up a security warning and tell the the end user, hey, um, by the way, you're going to internet, is that okay for you? Except that there was in the API a special flag which could be set and allowed the developer to say, well, do not prompt. And this is exactly this piece of assembly over here. And I'm very proud to show assembly during a keynote. Um, so yeah, it exactly says that. It uses this flag, do not prompt so that you would not get the warning and still go to internet. And then it would build the HTTP request and contact the remote server. To do that, well, it was uh, like on Android. On Android now, you have permissions, okay? So when you want to go to internet, you have, well, that internet permission that nearly every application has. On Symbian, it was called network services capabilities. And you have that for plenty of other stuff. You want to do this or that. You had to get the correct capability. And in some cases, for the malware, for instance, um, this one, the power management capability, requested the malware author to have kind of a higher developer uh, status or rank. I don't know how uh, it should be called. And to do that, well, you had to sign your application, and to sign the application, you had to go through a kind of a um, certification program, a little bit like the developer programs that we have for iOS and Android now, okay? And the malware authors probably went through this. It, was, it cost them 20 US dollars per year, so for, it wasn't really expensive. They went through Symbian Express signed. They got their virus uh, signed, and then the application was on the store, and it seemed perfectly legitimate, and lots of people downloaded it. Of course, after a while, well, people said, oh, this is an issue, this is a malware, so the certificate was revoked, but that was, of course, kind of several months afterwards, so, well, it was a kind of a little bit too late. We didn't have only um, mobile malware on uh, Symbian. Of course, there were other operating systems, even if Symbian was really the major one at that time. But you will remember that we had WinCE. Uh, iOS, I'll talk about this one a little bit later. BlackBerry is another one. And the other thing that we had very much is JavaMe. JavaMe is um, a Java platform for mobile environments. And it was very well supported by mobile phones at that time, including low-cost ones. And people would develop that way quite easily, writing in Java um, their application to do this or that. Pretty, um, pretty useful and, um, uh, for, for developers. And of course, for malware authors as well, they, they use that, and this is one of the examples there of a Trojan dialer. It poses as an application for divination and also dating. And as you can see, it's not hiding the fact that it is sending an SMS to a short number, which is 151. Except this one was working actually only in Indonesia. And in Indonesia, um, this short number was actually used with a special format to transfer from one bank account to another funds. So while they were doing that, victims were most of the time okay to pay 
for a premium phone number because they thought it was for divination services, but they didn't know that actually they were also transferring from for their account to the one of um, the criminals. Okay, so that's wh wh the the things that we had, and we had lots of those Trojan dialers, lots of things on um, on Javami for that at that time during I'd say 2006 to 2012 mainly. Then in 2009 we start to have the very first malware for iOS and for Android. It started in 2009. If I recall correctly, I think that uh, Android was released in 2008 and iOS slightly before end of 2007. Okay, so quickly after that, we had the first few malware. Now, most of those were for jailbroken phones or rooted phones, because I don't know if you remember, but at that time, rooting your phone was kind of a big thing. Because, of course, the first few versions of those um, operating systems were a little bit limited. So people felt that it's, they needed this or that feature, they would root the phone, get the additional uh, missing features, and were happy with that. Um, this phenomenon kind of disappeared actually quite quickly by 2016. We have around five or six percent of people who are rooting their phones, okay? So really far less than before that in 2012. Of course, it inspired uh, people for their malware. So this is actually the next screen. You probably remember that one. And um, yeah, actually, you can win those two stickers. I have them in my backpack. Um, it's really collector's stickers, as you can see. Um, if you remember, so this one, I'll, I'll just warm up a little bit your memory. It is called EEKey, and at that time, it was targeting jailbroken iPhones. And everybody who had jailbroken their iPhone but not changed the default password, which was I, uh, Alpine, okay? Well, they would change the password of SSH and modify the wallpaper. So, anybody remembers or is fast enough to Google that and find it on Google? Uh, what was the root password they changed it with? Wasn't it, wasn't it SSH? No, not SSH. If you want to win this very, very cool sticker, no? Come on. Because the next question is, even, you can, you, you're going to have another chance, but it's going to be even more difficult. So this one is really your, your chance to get it. I'm not seeing any raised hands, so. OK, it's oh shit. And now, actually, uh, I don't know if you remember, if some of you remember this, um, this screen there. But actually, it's the only one that uh, usually people remember with the photo of Rick Astley. But it's absolutely not the most dangerous version of Eki. Actually, there was, after that, a far more dangerous one. Now, I don't know if some of you remember what that version was doing. Same thing, you can try. Ah. So the, um, this, this is really probably too old for you, okay? But, <laughs> uh, well, actually, it was redirecting um, all your requests to your mobile bank and uh, sending that to the attacker's website. And quite strangely, people remembered um, this one with the photo of Rick Astley and just changing the wallpaper. But actually, uh, going to the real attacker's website, uh, this one was really far more dangerous than that. Bye-bye, all the ones I've discouraged. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, you were disappointed you didn't get the sticker. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I know that there's the workshop in parallel. So, yeah. Uh, we had lots of Android uh, root exploits at that time, and of course they were also uh, used in some uh, malware. 
uh, very much actually in the early years, so 2011 and 2012. Nowadays, we have only very, very few malware who are using exploits, let alone root exploits, because they don't need it, okay? We don't really need those exploits to have malware do what they want on, their, on the mobile phone. The thing that has always existed, I'd say nearly, or starting 2006 and is still existing now, is release spyware. That's the kind of class you always see. So those are a few um, screenshots of old spyware. So FlexiSpy, you might know, because it's, it was there in 2006, and it is still around in 2023, okay? Still doing spyware. In that case, it was posing as a backup application, okay? Pretty nice. And you had some, another one, Call Magic. There were quite a couple of other ones. Um, I think it was called Wave Secure, uh, Spy Magic, Mobile Spy, you know, lots of um, those types of name. The situation hasn't improved for that. In 2023, we still have spyware. And I'd say that even worse, we have been kind of accustomed to having some parts spying us on our mobile phones. This is really the example of adware where, for instance, well, we have adware which are just leaking out all the time or a subscriber identifier without any uh, without us really, really raising any alarm. Um, it will also leak um, the list of applications we've installed on our mobile application, our IP address, our MAC address, and plenty of things like that. And this is kind of nearly normal. Uh, to be honest, for instance, those which are leaking the IMEI, so this is the identifier of the mobile phone, they are so numerous that I am never detecting and reporting an application as a malware if it's just leaking that, because I would be detecting all applications uh, in the entire world, okay? So it's not sufficient to be classified as a virus any longer. The thing which has really evolved, perhaps, is the state-sponsored surveillance, okay? So you might remember there for already a couple of years, Pegasus. In June, there was Predata, and now in September, LastPass. Those are really, those are spyware which are professionally developed with zero days, which are targeting special individuals. Um, this is kind of a little bit new. We didn't have that in um, 2006, or if we had that, well, we didn't know about it, okay? <laughs> Newer parts, a little bit newer parts. I think that around 2012, we have what we call, what I call the explosion of Android malware. We're gonna have a look at the figures for that. This is the number of simian samples, malicious ones, that we have. So at the beginning, uh, a little bit below 3,000, and well, still, it grew up pretty much, 2013, a little bit below 12,000. Uh, malicious samples on Symbian. It seems pretty high already, but if we compare to Android, by 2012, Android has uh, totally outranked uh, Symbian. At the beginning, it's so low in 2009 that you hardly see the bar there, but it grows very fast. So you see all the time, like people, uh, yeah, I see many marketing messages about exponential growth. And most times it's totally wrong, it's not exponential, but here it's sub-exponential as a matter of fact. Um, and this is the curve, well at least the beginning of it, the curve for Android um, malware. Pay attention to the unit. This is 10 million samples, 20, 30, 40. So now in 2023, a few weeks ago, we have 42 million malicious samples. Now, I've got to explain a little bit what are samples, because it's not that obvious, to be honest. The problem is that in the antivirus industry, it is actually very difficult to count malware, because malware is not that much kind of defined. It can consist of several files, several actors, several things. So it's a little bit difficult. So most of the time, we do something which is a little bit approximate, and we use, we count samples, or we count families. Either way, 
it is an approximation and it's not perfect. The issue with samples is that we, our figures are gonna be a little bit too high. Why? Because a sample is basically uh, every single uh, and different file that we have in our malware database. Okay, so if we take, for instance, this, this malware, this one is actually um, mobile banking botnets. This application, well, actually, it is packed. So inside that, you have a packer. You can consider that this is a malicious packer, so this can also be put separately in the malware database as a sample. It is, that is as the malware is packed, well, somewhere you've got an encrypted payload. The encrypted payload can also be considered as malicious, so it can be part of the malware da database. And then it needs to be decrypted, so that also is another file there that you can want to keep in your malware database. So in some cases, it's not always the case, but you can have one single malware, which is reported as four different samples there. It won't be always the case because sometimes we don't wish to keep this one or we don't key, want to keep the encrypted payload or some, something like that. So you'll have only, I don't know, maybe two samples for one malware or just one for one, but you will have a little bit more than expected. So what that means is that if we have, if I were to say that we have 42 million malicious samples, Maybe it only means that we have 20 million malware, but it's still an enormous amount, and it's the range of amount which really counts, rather than the exact figure. Then you could perhaps say, okay, if samples are really bad to count, how about counting families? That would be great, except nobody knows how to do that, because it's not just like for individuals, uh, where it is more or less easy to create a genealogy. Here, for mobile malware, it's extremely complicated and we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to classify, this one is gonna be this family, this one is gonna be this other family. The reason is, for instance, that, well, some malware author will want to pick up some code from another family. So in the end, okay, which family is it? Is it this one or is it this one? Okay, or for droppers, a dropper is a piece of malicious code which is intended to drop different malware. But the malware it drops can change at any moment. Okay, so one day it's gonna drop a spyware. The, other, the next day it's gonna drop a ransomware. So how are we counting the dropper? Are we counting it as the ransomware or as a, are we counting it as uh, the spyware? Okay, so this is why it's difficult. So that being said, just keep in mind, if we have, let's say, 20 million Android malware, it's already enormous. Now the current trends of what I am seeing nowadays, every day, when I am analyzing Android malware, well, what do they look like? Um, I'd say I have called that like all-in-one mobile botnet is what I have very much. A few years ago, this used to be like more banking botnets where the sole intent of the malware would be to grab your banking credentials. But now those malware have kind of um, expanded their features and they can also have some other features like um, remote access to your smartphone. They'll take regular f uh, pictures of what you're doing, for instance, or they'll actually give you a remote shell on, on, on the phone, okay? Um, the other thing also is that sometimes they, they offer features such as locking your screen and asking for a ransom. So it turns the initial banking Trojan into a ransomware. And well, what is sold, basically, is the entire kind of malware which is doing all of that. In terms of implementation, well, they are all packed and obfuscated. Packing started for mobile malware around 2012, 2013, something like that. Nowadays, if I receive a malware and it's not packed, honestly, it's because it's written by a noob. 
uh, and he's or she is just trying out the malware and it's the first version and wants to test it and we were early and we got the version. But otherwise, it's always packed and obfuscated. That's the rule. The other thing that they seem to be doing all the time these, uh, these days is abusing the accessibility API. Now, this is on Android, and the, the issue there is that uh, it's really powerful what they can do with that, nearly whatever they want. And for instance, they can automatically disable Play Protect on the smartphone, or display overlays, and they do, the, do that very much. So for instance, you have your mobile banking application, you launch that, and then, well, um, the mobile malware sees, oh, there's a mobile application there. I'm going to put an overlay, a phishing overlay, on top of that, and uh, I'll grab the credentials. And of course, the victim, well, the victim is going to type things there, up there, on the, on the phishing uh, layer. And, um, but there's no, it's really difficult for the victim to understand that it's not the right application because it's not visible, it's just on top of it. Okay. The only visual thing, and there really is something, a screen you should really watch carefully. If ever you see that on your Android phones, well, the icon here will change, okay? But the rest, the text, activate accessibility services for this or that application. This is something you've got to memorize. If you see that while you are installing an application which is not for accessibility, so disabilities as a matter of fact, then there's a big, big, big warning. It's probably a malware. Okay, so do not accept to give um, authorization to this application, uninstall it, and report it. It's really very likely it's a malware there. And the issue here is that, well, you are security aware, but the random person in the street, when I asked a little bit about this accessibility services, um, the, the term accessibility is not really well chosen for them because they thought it was for to get access to something. And they thought the application needed access to something. And they thought, oh, well, it needs access to this and that. Perhaps, why not? And they said, okay, to the application. Okay. So it's difficult to notice for the, for the victim there. The other thing I am starting to see, I'm not really sure yet that um, it is um, uh, really a trend or not, is Flutter-based malware. So Flutter is um, a platform which is developed by Google and which help, uh, helps the developer write something with a single code base. And then it compiles natively on various platforms like iOS, Android, Linux, and Mac. So in terms of development, this is great because you write your program so the language is Dart, but it's pretty nice. I, I got to like it a, a little bit. Pretty nice. You do your development and then, well, you only have one source code and it does it for, for everything you need. And it's efficient because it is compiled natively. It's not like uh, a virtual machine. Okay. The issue is for reverse engineers like me. It's a nightmare than when we get malware with that. Because um, Flutter is inherently uh, obfuscated, and also Dart, the language, when it gets compiled natively, well, it uses non-standard conventions uh, for the call of uh, routines, and it is using different registers. So sometimes it has a science for this or that platform, a given register for a specific use, but no other language is using that normally. So all disassemblers and decompilers are really kind of lost there. So until we get better tools there, and I'm actually working on that, hopefully we, we will get things a little bit better in the next few years, I hope so. It's going to be really difficult to handle malware which are coded with uh, Flutter or similar things. And um, for instance, we had um, Moneymonger and Blue Horse, and most people are treating that as a black box for now. You have a look at what you have at the beginning and what you have at the end, and from that you kind of deduce and try to guess what the malware is doing. But it's not very, uh, very easy to do it that way. 
And um, it's probably not the way reverse engineering should be done for malware, of course. So I have talked about malware and their evolution. Now let's talk a little bit about threat actors. How have they evolved since the beginning? So now this is the past a long, long time ago, you know, just like in Star Wars, a long, long time ago in the galaxy. Um, people were writing uh, viruses mainly because it were, they wanted to prove it could be done for kind of aesthetic reasons or uh, at worst like teenager pranks. Okay. But to be honest, we, we have kept this in mind as hacking, because those were real, real hackers, um, that this was kind of cool, but it was a long time ago and it no longer exists. Nowadays, and please keep this in mind, and it has already been as such for at least 10, 15, 15 years, um, malware authors are not doing it for fun. They are not funny. I don't find them funny at all, to, to be honest. But they are doing it for money, for really malicious intents, for a polit political strategy and warfare. So um, do not keep in mind this image of a cool hacker as a malware author. No, they are not. They are stealing from your grandmother. They are fueling some money for drugs, for terrorism or things like that. And we should rather fight them than be helping them. OK? Um, as for the way they are organized, like five years ago, they were still using very much the dark net to communicate uh, with each other. But many sites have been seized on the dark net and they are no longer using that. Now they are using what we use also, which is instant messaging and very much, for instance, things such as Telegram, where they advertise their products. Because yes, they see their malware as products, okay? And they are handling it as products. And as a matter of fact, you have companies where you have people who are in charge of hiring, of human resources, of system administration, uh, and all that stuff, okay? It's really organized stuff. It's not like just a random poor guy in a garage uh, with a hoodie or something like that, okay? And um, they advertise their product on YouTube or and make a video of that, that. Actually, I'm sure of it because I, I uh, researched that like maybe 15, 15 days ago. If you type on YouTube today, you search, put keyword Android, botnet, malware, you're going to find um, um, a video of a botnet which is being demonstrated. Okay, and you're going to see something which is new there. And if you are a um, customer, well, you can get a, a demo. And that way you can ensure that the product that you are getting is going to deliver the right bandwidth, that you'll get enough people who get infected, that the botnet is able to sustain the charge and things like that, okay? So it's, you've got that, that sort of thing. As for the prices underground, so it really depends. Basically, for a remote administration tool, the prices range around 100, 200, perhaps 3,000 uh, dollars. If it's a botnet, usually it's higher. It's around rather from 500 dollars to 3,000 or 4,000 dollars. It really very much depends on the reputation of the author, how big the botnet is, and all the services that you get around. Because sometimes you don't only get the binary, but you get it installed somewhere for you on various hosts, or you get a sysadmin to help you out. You've got services, just like, you know, like in regular companies. Um, sometimes they steal e each other and they complain. Um, this is the only funny one that I like. So there's something, hey, this one, this guy, he stole from me. This is my code. Um, it's not his. He shouldn't be able to, to sell that one. Okay. Um, no honor among these. Um, the other thing I'll see, fun fact, is um, well, that they get reviewed, just like on Amazon. Okay. Oh, this one. Um, I, I bought something from him. Um, very good quality. It's working well. I like it. Five stars. Okay, so you get that as well. 
Now the tools. What are the tools that we have to do reverse engineering of mobile malware from the beginning to now? So a long time ago, it was in 2011, I remember I presented a system uh, where um, the, I was creating my own operator in our mobile phone lab to ensure that mobile phones which were infected and I was testing the viruses on would not propagate to uh, the operator's network, okay? That was a really big issue because we had worms which were propagating through SMS and MMS and I did not want this to go on uh, the operator. So, well, it was possible to do that at that time with OpenBTS and USRP, there were a couple of ways to do that. It was quite a, an important setup to, to do. And um, I remember that at that time it was a little bit difficult because at least in France, probably I think also in Belgium, you're not authorized to create your own operator that way even if it's restricted to just one room, okay? And in particular, I was asked to handle emergency um, uh, numbers. Just in case one of my colleagues happened to pop in the lab, uh, feel bad, well, I don't know, something bad happened and wanted to call the, the emergency number, that should be possible. So that was kind of a nightmare to, to enable, but we had to do it. Fortunately, nowadays, we no longer have to do this because, um, well, Malware are propagating through internet, and it's far easier to block internet communication than it was, used to be for this operator network, okay? We can just block this, have a firewall, have web filtering, have, we have plenty of tools that all of us know to, to, to help that, or to fake a website, fake, fake a host, and do things like that. So this part is easier, fortunately. The thing which hasn't improved is debuggers. At Symbian times, there was a debugger uh, which was working with IDA Pro in parallel. It was working, it was a bit difficult to set up, and this hasn't improved. We still don't have any good debugger in 2023 for Android. For those of you who are using perhaps Jeb, uh, Jeb is a professional decompiler, um, there is a debugger which is in there, but, um, well, it's a bit limited. You cannot actually inspect the value of variables all the time, uh, which is a great issue for a debugger, right? Um, so, to be honest, we don't have anything as good as just the symbol GDB um, for Android yet. The other thing, oh, this one I, I like because uh, this one, probably many of you won't uh, agree with it. Um, so it's not just like a troll, I hope that you will be discussing that uh, among yourselves afterwards. But yeah, I do think that at least for some of the young ones, dynamic analysis is evil and static analysis rules. Um, you are using dynamic al analysis far too much and relying on it far too much. It is true that you get your answers more quickly with dynamic analysis. It's kind of automated. It goes quicker. You get the results. In the end, your manager is happy. Okay. But do not forget that there are drawbacks. First, you risk propagating the malware. First thing. The other thing is that, well, uh, if you are able to ensure that you're not propagating, you are still contacting at some point the um, remote servers and doing that, you are giving them some information of how you proceed to do your malware analysis, okay? And you're giving them information about when you're doing it, how you're doing it, what time, how frequently, and things like that which enables them after that to do some anti-antivirus um, anti, anti uh, stuff there. The final drawback is that you are only seeing one execution path. So one part of the malware, but not all of it. So because of all those reasons, I, th I would say, um, actually, to most of you, well, don't be lazy. I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not lazy from time to time, but Try not to be lazy and do more static analysis. It's more difficult at first, but then you'll get used to it and you'll go faster and faster. And only resort to dynamic analysis when static analysis has failed. Like, you know, it was really heavily obfuscated, natively obfuscated. You couldn't get through after hours. Well, in the end, 
ours is money, you've got to do something else, okay. But don't use dynamic analysis as first intent, for sure. Conclusion. So we'll just wrap it up before a few questions if we have time. Um, lovely research topics would be debuggers and also symbolic execution, which would be actually a very good alternative to dynamic uh, analysis. Then there are a few paths also that we have to investigate, um, like the generation of malware uh, through artificial intelligence. It actually already exists. We already have some Android malware which are generated by AI. So this is something we have to handle, of course, because then it's kind of polymorphic and a little bit more difficult to catch and detect. Um, and then I've discussed about Flutter, but yeah, anything which comes from, well, I don't know, cross-platform malware um, with a single code base, well, the malware authors, they are software developers in the end, and they will like uh, to have to maintain only one source code. So if that is possible for them, they are probably going to go into that. So this is also another area which I believe is interesting to research in. Final thing was about, yeah, about um, if you want to keep things for history, well, just keep in mind that links will be broken. So yeah, you've got to back it up one way or another, a stronger way. And the final thought I'd say for every one of us, uh, at the end of the day, ask yourselves if, have I been working on security or on insecurity? If you're meant to work on insecurity, so be it, okay? I'm not discussing that part. But if you are claiming to be a security researcher and in the end you helped um, the malware authors, well, maybe there's an issue, okay? You're just shooting in your foot, okay? That's it. So, if you have any questions, and thanks for your attention, meanwhile. Thank you very much. It's uh, really nice to deep into the past. Um, one of the changes I have seen, uh, and it's about your statement, do static analysis instead of dynamic analysis, is that most of the malware nowadays is much more fragmented and needs a dynamic part because the dropper is being downloaded from certain parties and is changing once in a while, etc. Uh, how do you handle the difference between static and dynamic and where do we draw the line between static and dynamic analysis? Um. Okay, so I, I, get, I get the question, and true, um, what is true is that, for instance, the URLs and the servers that they are going to is changing all the time. But if you do reverse in the malware, for instance, statically, the, um, uh, the domain name generation algorithm, for instance, you can get heads up to quite a lot of uh, the websites it is going to, uh, to go to, and I think this is something nice to do if you have time to do it before, to do that statically. And then you will be a little bit head, uh, heads up to that. And of course then if you need to grab the malware there, you do have to go and contact it, to go to contact the website and grab it at that point. Okay. Um, because um, that's not something you can uh, virtualize, of course. So I'd say the first point, if you want to be sure not to be all the time like a little bit late, well, we, to be honest, in the antivirus industry, most of the time, we are always a little bit late. But if you don't want to be too late, um, first do the reversing, that's what I would do. Reverse um, the, the domain name generation algorithm, get that, and then uh, jump to dynamic analysis to grab the new samples. Yes, and then afterwards you go back again to analyze the new samples. If they have changed, you have to do again static analysis there. And hopefully in the end, uh, you will see there's a common pattern between those and uh, develop um, a signature which is more efficient that if you had just got them without an analyzing them and say, well, I've got to just um, sign this or that um, part. Are there, test. Are there any questions in the live stream room?
No questions. Okay. Any questions? Hello. Uh, I really appreciated the talk. Uh, one point or one detail uh, that I am curious about with the evolution of mobile malware over time, do you think as a security control, and I say this accepting things like one-click exploits like you see with NSO Group and similar that are very targeted, but for the more commodity criminal malware, do you think a lot of the security aspect in terms of preventing or mitigating these are more device and operating system side in terms of hardening, or do you think this is more of a platform issue when it comes to hardening or greater review on the App Store side of things for distribution of payloads, even if it's not countering the payload itself? Okay, it's interesting. Um, an interesting question. The, I think, unfortunately, it's going to be difficult to um, to avoid this kind of malware, such as you know NSO and the things they they develop, because they are skilled and they find uh, vulnerabilities. But even if we can try not to leave too many holes, there will always be holes in everything we we develop. It's the way it is, unfortunately. And I fear that they all they will always find a way to get through that. So um, I would think that the prevention is not so much technical on this part, like it's going to be difficult to prevent uh, those malware from running on the smartphone, but rather uh, like on educating the targeted people, like, well, if you, you cannot leave your mobile phone just by a table, uh, well, uh, not like that, okay? Do, don't leave it there, um, don't leave it accessible to people, uh, do not install this or that application from unknown stores or things like that. Or uh, if it's a professional um, a mobile phone from somebody who is like, you know, um, a VIP, well, don't install any application at, at all. And if you want, use your personal phone to install those applications, but have like separate mobile phones for that. I think the solution would come for there. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think I don't have the right answer to, to your question. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more questions? If not, the next talk is at 11 uh, about reverse engineering uh, EV chargers in Norway. Uh, so you have 15 minutes for a coffee and uh, see you then. Uh, yeah. Thanks again. I'll be hanging out. Thanks.